Okay. Welcome. Pastor and I thank you for coming. Uh-oh. Did you turn off? Okay. Pastor and I thank you for coming tonight. And the pastor encourages you to ask questions during the Bible study. Cora Ten Boom said, The wonderful thing about praying is that you have, that you leave a world of not being able to do something and enter God's realm where everything is possible. Nothing is too great for his almighty power. Nothing is too small for his love. On the screen, it says, It is written, Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 39. Pastor? This is open the slide. I know it's kind of a funny looking slide, but it's true. It says, how it looks trying to work your way to God instead of relying on grace. He's never going to make it. He's going to try, but he's never going to make it. He's going to be clamped up in that ladder. Go ahead to the prayer slide and get a chance. While it looks like things are out of control behind the scenes, there is a God who hasn't surrendered his authority or his sovereignty. That is something that we need to hang on to and with all the stuff that's going on in this world right now. We need to hold on to that thought. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these things for the Bible study tonight. Lord, we, it's never too late to sh- sh- shuttle some more in here also, Lord. But Lord, we thank you for the ones who come. We are grateful every time we, we have a, someone coming here for Bible study and worship service. We pray for the students at Fletcher, Lord. We lift them up to you for to help them with their studies, help them with things that they need to help further their career. We also pray for Joey and his little girl, who I found out he was a, he came through here a few years back. He let me know he, he had tested positive for COVID, had some mild symptoms, and his, then a little bit later his daughter tested positive for COVID. So we lift both of those up to you in prayer, and we ask that you look after them and you heal them and you strengthen them. And Lord God, we thank you for all your blessings. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, Miss Terry is going to be upset with me because I tried, we're going to do two chapters tonight. There's a lot of genealogies in there. But there's a lot, I'm going to read all of them. And bear with me with some of the pronunciations. But what we're going to do is we're going to stop at key verses and we're going to discuss them and then we're going to move right on through. Well, we're not going to dwell on every little verse of genealogy. And uh, the first one says, now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. Now, the key thing to really look at as we read through these genealogies is how many people came from just six people to start with. And then if you think, go back even farther, the day all came from two people. So let's get started. And if you've got a question, you want to say something, you know, feel free to do it. Verse 10, 1 says, Now this is the genealogy, and I just read it, of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and sons were born to them after the flood. So after the flood, they started doing what God said, be fruitful and multiply. And verse 2 says, the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madiab, uh, Javan, Tubal, Meshach, and Trias. The sons of Gomer were a- uh, Ashkenaz, Ripheth, and uh, Togomara. The sons of Javan were Elijah, uh, Elijah Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodamin. Verse 5 is what we're going to talk about though. It says, from these the coastline peoples of the Gentiles were separated into their lands everyone according to his language, according to their families into their nations. So we see in verse 5 that these these uh, descendants of Noah through his three sons and three daughters-in-law, they're already kind of branching out and setting up their own little bailiwick what they want to do. And the scripture 
is separating those people out. And when it talks about Gentile or the Gentiles, what it's talking about is non-believers. And you have to remember that when Genesis was written, it was written by who? By Moses. After, after they came out of the, out of Egypt. So he's looking at this from the Hebrew perspective of all these other ones who came out. And like I said, he's all scripture is superintended by the Holy Spirit. So whatever he put in here is what the Holy Spirit gave him to do. Then it says the sons of Ham were Cush, Miseram, uh, Put, and Canaan. Now remember we said when Noah cursed his son who laughed about him being naked in the tent, he didn't he did not uh, curse the son, he cursed the son's son, he cursed Canaan. I guess maybe he figured he'd die off before Canaan got big enough to get a stick after him. I don't know. But that, that was the case. And it says the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizmorah, Put, and, and Canaan, as we said. It said the sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, uh, Sabatal, Ramal, uh, Sabachan. And the sons of Ramal were Sheba and Dedan. Cush begot Nimrod, and this is another verse. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one of the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Erech, Akkad, Kalniah, and the land of Shinar. Now, when you think about it, when you hear somebody call somebody a Nimrod, that's a slang. That was not a compliment. That was not saying that you were a man, you were a mighty hunter. That's not what they were saying. But um, but that's what, what, it, what it means right now when we're talking about it. But verse 11 says, From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh, and uh, Rehoboth, uh, Ir, Tela, and Rezin between Nineveh and Caleb, that is the principal city. So we're, we're these people coming from six people. They're multiplying, being fruitful, multiplying. They're separating out. They're building their own little towns, cities, and villages and stuff. So they're they're doing what they need to do. They're right now. They're not staying centralized. They're not talking the same language. They're speaking a different language. And it's amazing how they went from speaking different dialects languages to everybody speaking the same language. But we'll, we'll look at that in verse 11, or chapter 11. Verse 13 says, uh, Miseram begot uh, Ludim, Anamin, Lahaden, and Natuun. And if I, if I mispronounce it, y'all correct me if you want to. 14 says, Parusim, and Caluhim, from whom came the Philistines and the Caphethorns. Now remember, we're talking about these people are spreading out, they're separating out. And that's the whole purpose, that's what's going on. That's what God told them to do. He told them to go out, he didn't tell them to, to stay in one place. I imagine if Adam and Eve hadn't ascended in the Garden of Eden, eventually he would have had to kick somebody out and said, look, you guys need to move on a little bit, move down the road and make your own life. Don't sit here with, with mom and dad and stay here forever. Get out and do what you're supposed to do. Cain begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heth, the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the uh, so now we're hearing names that we've been reading in the Old Testament of people who, the people of Israel, when they came out of um, out of Egypt, they were to go against and defeat to to claim the Promised Land of Rome. The verse 17 says the Hivites, the Archite, and the Sinite, the Averdite, the Zimmerite, and the Hamathite. Afterwards, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. So Canaan was cursed by Noah 
but he became the ritual. He became the father of, of the great people, a bunch of people. Great, when I mean, when I say great, I don't mean, man, these guys are cool. I mean, just a big group of people. Verse 19 says, And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as you go towards Gerar, as far as Gaza. Then as you go towards Sodom, Gomorrah, Adamah and Zebion, as far as Lashon. These were the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. So these, these uh, offspring of or the three sons of Noah, they are, I mean, they're getting with, with the program. They're out multiplying, they're building cities, they're building uh, cultures and things. We're going to see that all of them are not good, but it started out. That's why I said every culture with any kind of a religious history, whatever it is, somewhere in that religious history, they have a flood account in there. It may not be just like Noah, the, the, the flood with Noah, but they have a flood account. They have a flood story to tell. And that's because all these people came from the same common breed stock, but as they spread out, the, the truth kept getting more and more diluted until it became less than what it was, but it still had remnants. That's why sometimes you see that when, when people in third world countries and uh, natives out in the jungle and stuff that don't have television, don't have, well, they probably got cell phones. Everybody's got a cell phone. I, I've seen that with some of the people I deal with in Africa. They don't have anything deep, they got a cell phone. And that's sad, but the information kept getting diluted. The more, the more it went out from the original people, the more it got diluted. Or not, yeah, diluted, watered down or diluted. Kind of like the gospel message today was when Christ went to the cross, he was resurrected on the third day and he sent it back into heaven after 40 days after his resurrection. That's pretty cut and dried. But today, you'll get so many different little versions, little tweaks on it that, well, he, did, he didn't really die, he just swooned, or all manner of things. Because people don't want to believe or trust in, in a risen Savior to save them. They think, well, I can do it myself. That guy on the ladder while ago, he thought he could do it himself too. Verse 20, these were the sons of Ham according to their families, according to their language and their lands and in the nation. So we, we talked about that, about them splitting out and creating cultures and uh, places of uh, people to live and work. Verse 21 says, and children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder. The sons of Shem were Ham, or Elam, Asher, uh, Arafax, Lud, and Aram. Now, when we look at these generations, the, the sons of Noah, it says, the, the historian has not arranged this catalog according to the seniority of birth. For the account begins with the descendants of Japheth, and the line of Ham is given before the, that of Shem though he is expressly said to be the youngest and the younger son of Noah. And Shem was the elder brother of Japheth. So it was just the way Moses decided to put it down. They didn't go in any particular order, didn't go by rank. But um, the generation said, the generations, the narratives of the settlement of nations existing in the time of Moses, perhaps only the principal ones, for though the list comprises the, son, comprises the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, all their descendants are not enumerated. Those descendants, with one or two exceptions, are described by names indicative of tribes and nations and ending in the Hebrew M or the English Ite. So what he's saying is a lot of these names that we read, it, this 
this guy's this is a descendant of Ham or Shem or, or Japheth. Well, really, what it's saying is these people are a descendant of Ham, Japheth, and Shem. Verse 24 says, Arafax begot Selah, and Selah begot Eber. To Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jokotan. Now Jokotan begot Almadad, and Sheleph, and Hazarmath, and Jerod. And you know what? Y'all can't do it because I don't have them up there for to get me on. 29 says, Ophir, Havilah, and Jobab, all these were the sons of Jobatan. Now, if you look back where it says in 25, it says, To Eber were born two sons, the name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Jobatan. So, There, there, there's one train of thought, and it doesn't come up until the Tower of Babel, when that when that comes up, and that's that'll be next week. But what what is theorizing? Everybody looks at the globe and says, you know, all that stuff looks like it used to go together like a jigsaw puzzle a long time ago. Well, when God confused the languages, He also confused the, the continents. And he put people on it and separated the land out. So, because he said, I want y'all separate, and he, he separated. But this is not what this is talking about. This is talking about it was divided, that they were separated, separated from the rest of it. 20, 26 says, Joe Katan begot, no, I read that one. Okay, 30. And their dwelling place was from Mesha. As you go towards Sephar, the mountain of the east, these were the sons of Shem, according to their families, according, according to their languages, and their lands, according to their nations. These were the families of the sons of Noah, according to their generations and their nations. And, the, and from these, the nations were divided on the earth after the flood. So. Really and truly, they're, they're doing the best they can to, to follow what God says. They're being fruitful, they're multiplying, they're building cities, they're building towns, and they're establishing cultures. That's not the important thing. The important thing is what you do with that when you do it, when you create these people. When, when, you know, what do you do with the cities? Do you build, do you build cities? and worship the one true living God that put you on a boat and sailed you for over a year in the flood waters and restored you to, to prominence in the dry land and made you the ones who were going to repopulate the earth. You'd think that would stick with you a little bit because you would carry that on a little bit more. You'd, you'd press that on. You know, uh, I, I prophesied that uh, Adam when he was 930 years old, he was sitting around a cook fire telling everybody that he could do this to him. He said, man, we had a sweet deal in the Garden of Eden. It, it, was, it was so sweet. We didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to iron clothes or nothing. We just ate the fruit of the garden. We tilled the soil a little bit, kind of kept the weeds out. We played played with the animals and stuff because they weren't eating, trying to eat us. We weren't trying to eat them. We just had a good time. But then Eve listened to the serpent, and I listened to Eve when I should have been listening to God, what he told me. But I, I, we had a sweet deal, but I messed it up. I'm sorry. We're not going to have to go from here. But there is a promise coming. There is the promise of a, of a Savior coming. Now let's look at 11. I think I had 32. I, I, I was hard on this, Terry. Anyway, we, we've read that. So we got that established. Now 11 said, 11 was this. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. How 
everything is not, you know, chronological. It's not laid out minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. This is over a, a, a few hundred years at least. Because we went from, you've got your people, you've got your country, you've got your nation, you've got your cities, your towns, you've got your language, to verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. I didn't understand that either because in the 10 it says that they were all speaking differently. Well, that's true. And that's what I'm saying. But remember this. When, and, and it, it can be just, it, it's both ways, it goes both ways. When God, the Holy Spirit, reveals something to the prophet, whether it's looking back or looking forward, he gives events, but he doesn't necessarily give a timetable. Just like in uh, Isaiah 9, 6, when it says, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and then said the, the, the government will rest upon his shoulders, well, when Isaiah prophesied that, when it was revealed to him to, to say it, he, he wrote it down like it's one thing. But Jesus was, came as a baby. He was a son, son of God. He was crucified and went back to heaven. That part about the government being on his shoulders, that hadn't happened yet. That's an already but not yet. And that's what this is. You know, we go, uh, we read this, it says, uh, Verse 32 says, These were the families uh, and sons of Noah according to their generations in their nations. And from these, the nations were divided. Everything was divided by the flood. And I agree. The next verse you read. And what makes this even more, I won't say confusing, but this wasn't written this way. It was written on a scroll. It didn't have any punctuation marks. It didn't have any chapter divisions. It didn't have anything. It just had the Hebrew in there. You know, and it, uh, when I look at Hebrew, I just see a bunch of sevens. I don't know. It's a beautiful language to hear spoken, and we have a, a man we like to go listen to sometimes that uh, he sings in Hebrew. I mean, it's beautiful, but the language looks like a bunch of sevens to me with a one every once in a while. So I don't know how it works. But anyway, this is the thing. When this was given to Moses to write down, he said, look, Moses, this is what happened back here. Now we're, we're coming to, to this part here. But he didn't give him the timetable. He didn't sit down and say, well, in, in the year of whatever, 1400 B.C. or 1200 B.C., whatever, this happened. And he, he didn't do that. He just said, this is what happened. This is in the order. But everything is, that's important is here, but everything that happened is not. But yeah, I, I can see that was, that's perplexing when you read it that way. But anyway, verse 11 again, 11 one says, now the whole earth had one language and one speech, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelled there, dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us be, make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. So when you think about it, when they went, the, the Hebrews, the 75 Hebrews went into Egypt, and you read about making bricks later on, well, they had, you know, the people had the technology to make bricks because they were making bricks for the Tower of Babel. That's, that's what they were doing. So it wasn't like it was a foreign uh, uh, skill. Verse four, 4 says, And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city. Nothing wrong with that. And a tower whose top is in the heavens, let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now, let, let's focus in on verse 4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. So, 
somebody's prophesying that something's going to happen and, and God's going to no, they don't call out and say God's going to do it, but somebody's prophesying that we're going to get scattered. You know, we're, we're sitting here, we're congregating here, we're doing this, we're, we're building this great city, we're building this, going to build this tower to make a name for ourselves, which meant they were making a name for themselves, but they were not going to be worshiping God. And when we start making a name for ourselves, we don't have a whole lot of time worshiping God and we're trying to get our career where we want we're trying to do other things we just get too busy and that that's where they were they were so busy making this great great city they were so busy building this magnificent tower to reach to heaven now I doubt they ever thought they could put enough bricks in the stack to make it all the way to heaven we've got some pretty tall buildings over in was it Dubai where the clouds, the clouds are below them, below the top floor, but they still haven't even come close to reaching, where, reaching heaven. They're just still in the atmosphere. When, when they get up there and it's 97 degrees below zero, they still, or minus, minus 97 degrees below zero, they still won't be high enough. But, Verse 5 says, But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Now, God, God's a, a curious God, except for the fact that he's all omniscient. He knows everything that's going to happen anyway. He knows how it's going to happen. So he didn't walk down and say, Man, man they're building this tower. I don't know what to do with this. They just came down just, just to check, to see how they were coming. Because he knew what he was going to do. The fact was, we were said just a minute ago, somebody was prophesying what he was going to do. He was going to separate them out. Verse 6 says, And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they began to, to, begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So, God, God, God is sitting there talking amongst the Godhead, saying, you know, these guys can do whatever they want to do. Like, he's not saying, you know what, these guys could supplant me. They could take me out. They could. He's not saying that. What he's saying is, is that they can do all manner of evil and wickedness. The more they go, the worse they're going to get because they're going they're getting more prideful. The taller the tower got, the more prideful they got in what they were building. What was the first sin in, in the Bible? When Lucifer thought he was God, could, could replace God, he was proud of who he was. He was the angel of light. He was pretty. And he, he just uh, he got ate up with that. So they weren't going to do anything spectacular, but they were going to be farther and farther away from God. Remember we said when it's, when they come off the boat, you should have had eight people. That they were down worship because we know Noah built the altar. As soon as he got off the boat, he built an altar and sacrificed the clean animal on it. They should have been down on, on all fours, spread out, thanking God every day that they survived through the flood. But it's like, uh, well, yeah, you got us through the flood, okay. Uh, we, we're chasing these animals. They made them scared of us, so we have to chase them down to catch them to eat them. But, hey, what have you done for me lately? And that, that's a, even Christians have that attitude. Well, what have you done for me lately? Well, he went to the cross he, that he didn't have to go to. He bled and died. He took the wrath of God upon himself. He became sin for all of us. Took, took all our sin on himself. Which, for a God who cannot stand to have sin around him, to take it all on himself at one, one moment in time, that had to be pretty terrifying, even for God. I imagine that's the only time God ever was terrified of anything that went on. And it was because 
all the all the wrath was poured out on Jesus, and God the Father turned his back. And it went dark for three hours until the account was satisfied. Now we're getting now verse seven. Remember we talked about Pentecost last Sunday. We, we had Pentecost Sunday. We talked about how people with different languages, different dialects came together after the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles and they got up as Peter started preaching. Well, all of them started preaching, really. The miracle was that they heard the gospel in their own language. Not some discernible gibberish that had to be translated. They heard it in their own language and they believed. So that is the book end of, of verse 7 it says come let us go down in there and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech so you had here in Genesis in Genesis 11 7 God said let's go down there and confuse their speech so they'll be separated in Acts the Holy God the Holy Spirit makes it does a miracle where everybody can hear in their own language the wonderful works of Christ. What he did, the gospel message, they heard it and they believed. So those are two bookends. He separated them out to, to send them away. Then he united them through the common hearing to, to bring them back into the fellowship of God. And I just have always thought, thought that was, uh, was unique that the two things coincided. The first thing to keep them from being unified and doing all manner of devilment, he split them up. And that's how the stories that we, we as I said a while ago, different cultures have different flood stories, but they have flood stories in their, in their, past, in their ancient past. And what that just says is they had the knowledge and just take your just take your own families and I'm not throwing something but I said don't take it that way take your own family cousins or nephews what, nephews and nieces whatever if you have a, a, a really good foundation of the gospel do you take it and you share that good foundation with the next bunch that came after you or do you kind of whitewash it a little bit maybe don't you know I've had people say, man, that stuff's just too tough. That, that's, that gospel stuff, that's just too hard to tell kids. Well, you know what? Kids are the ones that need to hear it first. Because if you wait till they get older, they're, they're going to have so many influences on them that you're going to have a hard time getting them back to the place where, where they will believe. So I, I stress it more than anything. You reach out to people. Share your faith with lost people. But... Make sure that you're sharing your faith with your kids and your immediate sphere of influence because I'll tell you what, that's what happened with these people. That knowledge, that reverence for God just kind of evaporated as they went along. And when God floods the world but puts you in a boat with all the animals and saves you, and then you go for a couple more hundred years because uh, Noah lived 350 more years after he came out of the ark. But we don't really hear much about Noah after he, he uh, cursed uh, Tainan. But the knowledge, the love, the knowledge, and the respect for God just dwindled down to nothing. And we'll see in the first verse of the chapter 12 God's remedy for that. But anyways, it says, he said, let's confuse their language and their speech. And it says in verse 8, So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. And remember why I told you that when God created everything, there could have been one body of land. When he said, y'all get out of here, you know, confuse your language and put them out, then you, I mean, you can look, like I said, you can look at a globe and say, 
this goes back could go back together like a jigsaw puzzle. It's not that hard to, to picture. And if we don't believe, and I had somebody tell me one day, I said, God couldn't do that. I said, God couldn't do that. He created all that. He could do anything he wants to do. He can do anything he wants to do. But anyway, verse 8, the end says, And they ceased building the city. Verse 9 says, Therefore its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the languages of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So verse 10 says, This is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was one of was 100 years old and begot uh, Arphax two years after the flood. After he begot Arphax, Shem lived 500 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Arphax lived 35 years and begot Selah. After he begot Selah, Arphax lived 403 years and begot sons and daughters. Selah lived 30 years and begot Eber. After he begot Eber, Selah lived 400 years, 400 and three years and begot sons and daughters. Eber lived 34 years. Eber lived 34 years and begot Peleg. After he got, he got Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg divided, lived 30 years and begot Ru. After he begot Ru, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Ru lived 32 years and begot Serug, and he, after he begot Serug, Ru lived 207 years. Now, are you noticing anything as we read through these? I know we don't have them up on the screen, but do you, are you noticing anything? The life lifespans are getting, starting to get shorter. Mm-hmm. Verse 22, Sarah lived 30 years and begot Nahor, and after he begot Nahor, Sarah lived 200, 100 years and begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years and begot Terah. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 119 years and begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now do you see anybody's name in there that looks familiar to you? And any of that or not? Okay. This is the genealogy of Terah. This is verse 27. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, Haran, and Haran begot Lot. So we've got Abram, and we got his nephew Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldees. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife is, what was Abram's wife's name? Well, it was Sarah. Sorry. Oh, Sarai? But, huh? Wasn't it like Sarai? Either way. Okay. I don't know how you pronounce it. But it wasn't Sarah. Yeah, it was going to be Sarah. But when we preach about Abram and Sarai or Sarah, Sarah, we always end up just calling them Abraham and Sarah Sarah, because it's easier anyway. So... But it goes, let's see. Uh, verse 29 says, Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sari, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Herod, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishkin. But Sari, Sari was barren. She had no children. And Terah took his son, Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan, 
And they came to Haran and dwelt there. So what do we see out of all this stuff? Everything is pointing to the one place where Israel is today. Everything is pointing to that. Now, when we get to the, of course, y'all have to do it on uh, YouTube or Facebook, but when we get to that point where they come in to Egypt and when they come out, they were in captivity and slavery for 430 years. That 430 years, God gave these Canaanites, Amorites, all these people in this area, he gave them a chance to give him regard, to worship him as, as we're all called to worship him. And they did, they did all manner of idolatry, they did all the things they could, and all these people groups that we've, we've read about in here in these two chapters today, and we've still got one more verse to read, but all of these people groups, they have one thing in common. You can't find any of them anywhere, but Israel is still standing. It's still a Jewish state. Yes, God's put them out, brought them back, put them out, brought them back, but he's always said that he would never put them out, out of the land without keeping the righteous remnant to keep to keep the Jewish nation alive. And um, Benjamin Netanyahu was talking with a world leader and it was a, I can't remember which country it was, they were talking about their populations. Well, the one nation had only been a nation for a hundred years they had millions of people. Now we're talking, you know, maybe 50, 60 million people. Israel, on the other hand, has really and truly been a nation since we're getting ready to talk about when they were right here next week. But there's only about 8 million Jews worldwide, 8 million. And they ask, how in the world can you be a, a people, a continuous people, even though they were out of out of their homeland for an extended period of time, different times, how is it that being a people that long, you can be only eight million people? And I believe the reason there's only eight million people is because when God prospered them, they got fat, dumb, and happy, and they went off the tracks, he had to discipline them. The reason these other people, people groups that we don't see, that we can't go find Canaanites anywhere, we can't find Amorites anywhere, is because he used these people to discipline Israel, the Jewish people, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. He used them to discipline them. Then when they got done disciplining in Israel, the Hebrew people, then he took care of the ones who were messing with his people. Though he, he caused it, he directed it, because the Jewish people needed correction, and the best way to correct them is to exile them from their homeland and put them in slavery somewhere else. But he always gave them a way back. He never, he never put them in slavery and said, I don't care, I'm never, never coming back for you, I don't care what happens. He always had a way back for them. He always had a set time. In, in Genesis, he told Abraham, that your people will be in captivity for 430 years, and they were. Jeremiah prophesied that the people would be in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, and what you know, they were. So all these things God uses to discipline his people, why in the world would we think that he wouldn't discipline us for disobedience and acting the fool? If, he, if he, he called Israel out, starting with Abraham, and he's disciplined them to get them where he wants them, and they're still not there. But we're not still where he wants us either. So that, that's what we have to work on. We have to continue. But the last verse is, So the days of terror were 205 years, and terror died in Haran. So 
The next next one is the promises to Abraham or Abram. But when we look at all, all, all these genealogies, it, it's, it's so important, especially the second bunch in 11, because I hate I hate it when it just says sons were born, you know, sons and daughters. You know, you have a mix. You've got to have sons and daughters. You can't have just sons because that wouldn't be good. You can't be fruitful and multiply with just sons. You can't be fruitful and multiply with just daughters. You've got to have sons and daughters to do that. And But you can look. Though you don't have a, a, a calendar or a timetable, you can follow these follow all these events and all the things that have happened, and you can fall, flow right in. Remember I said that the Bible, God's Word, is coherent from Genesis to Revelation. It has a common theme all the way through. It's about the shed blood of Christ. You have to Sometimes you have to dig at it a little bit and, and to get it, but that's the whole theme of the Bible. It's about our redemption. It's about the redemption of Israel. That's what the, the tribulation is going to be about, is the, the uh, restoration of, of Israel. And you got 144,000 Jewish Hebrew witnesses that are going to be out witnessing everybody during the tribulation. And uh, more people will be saved during the tribulation than have been saved through the last 2,000 years. That was the last verse, and I'm sorry to say this is the last Bible study we're going to have together. But y'all are free, free to, to watch it and make comments on, on YouTube and anything else. But we look forward to seeing you Sunday when you come in. I didn't think I could get through all of both those chapters in 49 minutes. But um, I didn't. Uh, it was. It was easier, I know it was a departure from normal, not having all the verses up there, but I just didn't feel like making out 60 slides with 60 verses on it, and they're just named. Because Miss Terry, she tells me, says, well, I see those genealogies really quick. <laughs> but you have to, and if, you, if, if, you'd have, if we'd have skipped those two chapters and just went to chapter 12, we would have missed a lot of things that, that are important to know. No, they're all important, but it's not the genealogy. It's all the names. The thing that I never wrap my mind about is the age of the people. How does someone live 205 years or more? Well, 950 like Noah. Uh, I know. I can't get my. And, uh, I, can't. I just, I, I know, I know it's just the Lord doing it, but that's, how, how can you Well, it, it all goes back to what I've been saying here. It was the climate. The climate, you know, the climate dictates a lot of things. And, and it was God, God gave them long life so they could do what? Be fruitful and multiply. And yeah, you know, when you read some of these in here, and it says, "Well, uh, I will pick one out." It just says, "And Fred was seventy years old, and he had sons and daughters. Did him and his did he wait seventy years to find him a wife, or did he, you know, was something else going on, or was it just uh, just the way they mentioned it?" But they lived long lives because they had to to populate the world. And, you know, the, the main patriarchs we look at, like Abraham, uh, Jacob, David, they didn't live, in, well, see, Moses lived 120 years, I believe. Uh, Abraham, I can't remember exactly how many long he lived. He lived, I won't say he lived 125, somewhere around 125 to 150 years. But, You know, it all worked out by God's plan. You know, God's not walking around thumping himself in the head and saying, man, I just didn't see that coming. I didn't understand. He, he knew all this was coming. He understands and he knows what needs to be done. 
and he he sit he stand sitting on his throne, moving the, moving us around where he wants us. Now that being said, he can move us where he wants us, but we still have the freedom to say yes or no to Christ. Because if if we ever get the point, and I won't call any names out, that we say, well, whoever's going to be saved is going to be saved. There's no use of me witnessing anybody. How do we know that when we, somebody we should have witnessed to, we were the one who was supposed to turn this person before they walked out in the street and got hit by a truck? How, how do we know that the, the person we decide that we don't think we need to share Jesus with because somebody else will surely get him? Or you know, that person is so so good and so righteous that they must know Jesus. No, I've got some neighbors across living in my neighborhood, let's put it that way. Very nice people, but they're not Christians. And, you know, if you go over there and ask them to help you with something, they'll help. If they need help, they'll come and ask me, and I'll go help them. And, but they're not Christians. And no amount of witnessing so far has made a difference. But we can't look. We can't let people look at us and say, oh, well, they're a Christian, so I want, I want what they have. I want to emulate them. And you also can't look at somebody and just think that they're uh, beyond help. Anybody got anything else to say about all these names and places and peoples? And... We don't use these names too much. Huh? You don't? No. No, you don't. Well, you know, you get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. You get Paul. Noah's a very popular name now, though. Noah is a very popular name. What? <coughs> Noah. No. 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 Yeah. Well, um, yeah. we got a we got a friend who's got a son named Noah. We have a, uh, a friend up in North Carolina, and their grandson's name is Noah. Sure. And they have a son named Noah. Yeah. 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 And they have a son named Noah. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You didn't tell them how to do it. You didn't tell them what tools to use. You didn't tell them to use a drill. So, you know, you really don't have any complaints. They did the best they could with what that, the information you gave them. And sometimes it seems like that with, with God, he, he gives us enough information, but he gives us enough sometimes that we can just be dangerous. And I just, you know, I, I, can, I can remember I got a Bible at home that I got when I was, I think I was like eight years old, seven, eight years old. It doesn't have a mark in that Bible. It's, now, now it's pristine. I mean, it's, you would think it had never been read. Actually, it probably hadn't been read too much. But all my other Bibles that I've used the last 20 years, they're marked up, scratched up, underlined, highlighted. And my, you know, my study Bible that I usually preach out of, it's got so many highlights and stuff in it and underlines in it when I'm going through it. Sometimes I can't even read what's in there. So I, so I bring this one. But, you know, I love God's Word. And the, the highlight of Mr. Terry Mises' day is when we read, we scripture together. And uh, we're in, in Psalm, Book of Psalms now. But, um, We'll, we'll, we'll read it and we'll say, well, he's talking about Jesus right there. That, that, that's talking about the, about the crucifixion. That's talking about this. If there's everything, everywhere we go, we, we read something and you can tell it's talking about Jesus, something that was going to happen to Jesus. And the reason they know this stuff is because the eternal, outside of time and space, God, illuminates that but he didn't illuminate every detail he didn't illuminate every little speck of stuff he gave what we needed to know to give us the faith to continue on but if you get into genesis and you start in the beginning god created the heavens and earth and if you say that's you know then you're, you're lost and if you're standing in the pulpit somewhere or in the sunday school class saying, yeah, chapter 1 of Genesis says in the beginning, God, hey, you don't have to believe it. You don't have to take that literally. That's, God said it. I believe it. And if, if I, you know, I don't see any prophet in not believing it. I don't see any prophet saying, yeah, God's word is kind of true. It's either true or it's not true. Let's tell you, last thing. You have the last word. Go to the next slide, then. It takes nine months to be born in this world, but only one second to get taken out. That's why I wake up and thank God every morning, because just waking up is a blessing. It says, can I get an amen at the bottom? And what this says, I don't know if y'all can read the number, it says, grateful addicts in recovery. And I, I, there's a, a, a group up in Monk's Corner, uh, I don't know what you call it, a home or a rehab center or what, but that's what they do. They, they rehabilitate drug addicts and different things. And um, that's, when we talk to them, that's the attitude they have. They're just thankful to be waking up every morning because they were so addicted that they didn't expect to live out any period of time. Ms. Terry, you want to close us in prayer?
Amen. Last, last slide. I think so.